Um, so this afternoon, I would like to welcome Chris Hattam, who is headmaster of a lovely prep school in the Hereford, uh, sort of Worcestershire border called the Elms. Um, good afternoon, Chris. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Good afternoon, Panda. Thank you very much for having me. I'm sorry it's the hottest day of the year. Um, but, not a problem. Um, so, um, Chris, I just want to ask you, actually, how long have you been headmaster of the Elms? I've been here uh, for two and a half years. So I started in January, which is a little bit unusual. Um, but I was given the option to actually wait until the next September, but I was just desperate to get here. So uh, I started in January, two and a half years, and time has flown very quickly. I'm sure, I'm sure it has, particularly with everything going on as well. Mm. Um, so uh, when did you first think you wanted to become a teacher? So my, my career, I'm, I'm not a career teacher. Um, I was at Sherbourne in Dorset. I went to Edinburgh University. Um, and I, when I left university, I ended up working with children with learning difficulties. I then moved into working with children with behavioural difficulties and I then actually ended up as a probation officer for four years. So I worked did two years working in West Cumbria with adults and then two years working with young offenders and the majority of my career has actually been working with young people. Um, I got very frustrated with the red tape in probation service and the opportunity came to move into a teaching role at Centre School in Cumbria and actually when I looked at it, the, the, everything I enjoyed was transferable, the working with the children, the helping to, to develop their characters and helping them to, to find who they, who they were, you know, set them on the course of, uh, to find out who they might be. Um, it was all very much sort of within teaching as it was in, in probation. Um, so that, that opportunity I took and I spent 15 very, very happy years at Sedford School, which is up in, the, up in Cumbria. Um, beautiful, actually quite similar surroundings to here, bizarrely. Uh, I went through the ranks there and went from a trainee teacher ending up as a housemaster. Um, and again, the, I suppose education was always an interest, but the pastoral care was always a, a, a deep interest of, of mine. Um, so yeah, that, that was my journey into, into teaching. What a fantastic uh, grounding, actually, to, to have had um, before becoming it, a master. I mean, amazing. It is, and, and uh, there's so much, you know, that I think, I think probably the biggest thing it's given me is the ability to uh, step back from a situation and, you know, not, not jump onto the first thoughts that, that might come into my head um, and to really keep things in, in perspective. Yes. I think, uh, exactly. which, which certainly in recent times has been quite useful. I'm sure it has. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, and um, what, what do you think you would have done? Um, I mean, obviously, you know, you've been a probation officer and um, all, all those sorts of things. But is there anything else you think you might have done if you hadn't gone down that route or this route? Yeah, I, police was always an interest for me. I think yeah. on leaving school, I, I had a, a real interest in becoming a policeman. Um, and actually, as it, as it went through, that, that waned, that interest waned. I would love to farm. I would genuinely love to farm. I've got a, a massive passion for the countryside and everything that goes on in it. Um, and I think that, especially at the moment with teaching, there's so, there's so many interactions on a daily basis that actually the, the allure of farming and having that, that sort of peace. So actually my, my wife and I have got a, a home up in Dumfries where we to camp every holiday. And that is very much a, a little bit of our our pasture land um, that we can go and set ourselves out for the holidays and we enjoy that um, that contrast with the, with the quiet. How lovely, it's beautiful up there. It so is. So beautiful yeah. isn't it. Um, and uh, so with the Elms, how would you best describe the the culture and ethos of, of your school? Culture and ethos, are, it's, it's interesting because for me they're, they're along with the word integrity they're probably the the three most important words in in education because i think the culture and ethos set the children on their way and what what i don't believe you can impose culture on children i think you create a culture within which you plant the seed and that's that's part of the privilege of of independent education you're choosing that 
environment within which you want your your child to to grow in um so the the culture and ethos here is very much i'd say it's it's quite organic you know we 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 surround the children with opportunity it's a, it's a very gentle school we're not driven by the the result we we believe in the journey being the the, the most important thing and then the result will come and i think as a result of that we have very happy children they they're kind they, of course they have their moments that's the mm. that's the beauty of children they're meant they to they've got to learn all of it they all do um but they're kind children but they, they're driven they they're excited about learning they're excited about the adventure that they're on and as a result of that they move from their maths lesson to uh, to the sports field back into drama to chapel to whatever they're doing with a sense of enthusiasm yeah. and as a result of that i think that our children would get the same grades if they were in a more of a hothouse style school they'll have the same grades they, they will achieve their potential but they'll be different children at the end of it yeah. So I think, you know, we have some parents who term our school sort of almost like an Enid Blyton education. It is, you know, there are no phones, there are no, no laptops or iPads that they just wander around with. We use IT appropriately when we need it for re as a resource or to produce documents. Um, but it's a traditional style of education. We want children to learn about each other. We want them to learn how to interact we want them to be resilient and actually they gain that resilience mm. through being in situations in a secure environment but that they they have to work hard to to work their way through um we want them to be independent you know and again as you, you surround them in a culture where they, they're given those those opportunities yes um, so yes. yeah um so i mean do you think schools in general have a type of pupil yeah, absolutely. And I think prep schools, it's, it's quite interesting. So I think prep schools, the type of pupil is probably de almost determined by the destination school that the yeah. prep school feeds. Yeah. So we're actually fully independent prep schools. So our children go to a plethora of, of schools. They might be off to Marlborough or to Harrow, to Eton, um, to Radley, Chelton Ladies College, Chelton College. You know, they, they really do go to the, the, the four, four corners. Um, and that's that's a joy. That means that we don't have to squash the children to fit a school. We we value their unique, um, you know, their identity, and that means that we've got a really rich tapestry here at school. You know, they, it's such an interesting school to, you know, children coming in, and one will be doing a project on moth collection, and the other one will be doing a project on the Mary Rose, and they they love that in each other. So, is there a certain type? I think that. You know, certain schools will will feed, you know, they might be independent, but they will feed a certain or two, you know, senior schools. Um, and that will lead to that, that school having a certain type. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. That goes back to the privilege of choice that is associated with independent school. And, you know, we are not the prep school for everybody. No prep school is. No. Um, and no independent school, no senior school would be. Um, that's part um, of the joy of it. Yes, exactly. And, and I mean, your thoughts, so you've kind of answered this question already. I was going to ask you what your thoughts were on, you know, competition and, you know, winning matches, you know, sport and, and um, you know, the pressures of children sort of feeling sad it's, if they're it's, bottom of the class. But you're very yeah. much not sort of too focused on we're not but that isn't to say that they don't come bottom in the class that isn't to say they don't lose a match that isn't to say that we don't celebrate winning um, but they so we talk we, we talk a lot about scholarship here um, because it's a big thing lots of people get get very hung up on scholarships for me scholarship is the the award of a scholarship is the icing on you know the cherry on the icing on the cake yes the the children benefit they grow through the process whether they get the scholarship or not what we talk about here is the journey you know the outcome is is important but all children have got different strengths and different areas that they need to work hard on um that you know that's our privilege is to help them find their strengths and help them to to dig in and get through those other bits but they've got to understand that that they will come last in a race or that actually they might not get a distinction in their violin grade three piece you know and that 
and dealing with that disappointment is important because that's that is resilience you know you you don't again it's something you can't impose resilience you can't say right if we do this i don't believe i don't think you can say well we'll do a course on resilience and after six sessions you will be resilient they learn that through experience um so yeah winning winning and losing both are important and i i would be fearful for the child also that went through school winning everything and having an easy time of it you know they need to be they do need to be stretched and they i spoke to parents this morning about the need for our children to fail they need to fail securely um, it's a learning need... curve isn't it Absolutely. it's part of their um emotional sort of well becoming stronger emotionally yeah. you've got to fail to experience we're, we're equipping them with, with, a, with a toolbox mm. you know that, that they that they will start to carry through life and that when they don't get the job they they dreamed of you know they they pick themselves up and get get on yeah. with it they don't get the promotion or you know they, they wanted three a stars to get into mm -hmm. edinburgh to read medicine and actually they get two a's and a b well you know yeah. you've got to pick up and and get on Part so of life, isn't it? exactly yeah. exactly and that, and that you know we it's educate the academic side of things is is really really important of course it is but the our job as a prep school is to prepare them for that senior school i want them on day one having been a senior school housemaster i know what they need to be able to succeed on day one i don't want them to wait till term three no. i want day one our, our children to be the ones with their hands up able to bounce back to be happy and be excited yeah. um because we don't finish you know we don't finish the product here um, no. for want of a, a better phrase we set them up to to race into that next stage yes yeah um and um do you think that mental health has become more of an issue over the last few years or do you think perhaps it's just actually now less of a taboo subject so it's talked about more or do you think actually the pressures of modern life now I, and technology i think it's a com worse? combination of both i think definitely there is a, a over the last 15 years I've been in education certainly you know having seen similar similar issues in probation service as well there was a far greater willingness to discuss it yeah um, I think teaching staff and you know all sorts of people parents as well are more aware of it so that brings with it a almost like a higher a higher rate but it's I don't think it's necessarily a higher rate I think it's a higher aware, higher awareness however I do think also that precious children feel, precious parents feel under for their children to succeed um children can't help but pick those those feelings up um yeah and we we do get parents coming here from other schools who say actually you know that the environment is squashing our chat character of our child mm. um and they, they they fear they worry about that um you know things things like at the Elms, we're very lucky. I don't, I don't have well-being or mental health or um, anything like that written on any walls. We have no posters up because we have chapel in the morning where the children can just spend 15 minutes reflecting. Uh, we have, you know, a, a beautiful farm where the children can go and collect chickens' eggs. You know, they can, they can go and sit in a tree. They can play by the stream. They can take ponies out to the field. Oh, you know, how it's, nice! It's, it is blissful. They're very, very fortunate children but they're therefore their well-being their mental health that space that they need yeah is just there you know yeah. it's, it's very yeah. the sport sport six days a week um it, you know that that that's fantastic them being fit and healthy without really realizing it yeah um yeah. it's it's all there but i do i do worry you know and, and again having seen children up between the ages of 14 and 18 as well i do think that the pressures they are under uh, to to succeed um are are something that we we all need to be aware of yeah yeah Absolutely. um so uh, moving on to this next question uh slightly related what are your thoughts and attitude um towards you know this social media and tiktok and TikTok. everyone knowing what everyone else is doing and instagram and yeah it's everything. I mean, I think what we've got to face is that it's never now going to go. You know, it's never going to disappear. It will forever be part of our lives and it will grow. It will be a, a, a part of our children's lives. Um, at the Elms, we, we have no 
no phones, as I said, you know, that we don't want the children to be on that. But then if they're a day child, they go home and they're on it at the end of the day. Mm. So it's a, a real case of working with parents, helping parents to be aware of what's going on out there. Um, Carl Hopwood, anybody who wants anything, he is the, he's the guru. Um, and we have him in uh, each year to talk to our parents, to our teachers and our children, right. just about staying safe online to, to raise them. You know, IT changes all the time and social media changes all the time. You know, and there, are, there are so many different tentacles that, that are there, you know. That, that too many. Can, too many. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we've just got to educate the children. We've got to give them that... Um, give them the, the confidence that if it starts to go wrong, they can speak up, you yes. know, because actually we, you know, it's, I know I'm teaching people to suck eggs, but you know, we, we look after our children and we, we don't let, you know, don't let them get into a car with a stranger, but then we give them a phone at 13 years old and the strangers are in their bedroom with them. You know, it's, yeah. A, yeah. it's oh. a very, it's a very odd thing that we, that we're all part of, you yeah. know, and, and, you know, we have to set the example for the children as well. Yeah. As, you know, I know I've been guilty of my children actually saying to me, Dad, can you put your phone away, please? Yeah, I've had it too. Um, yeah. We're all guilty of it, aren't we? We are. But it's, yeah. it, does, it does worry me because it's a dependency. You know, I haven't got a problem with it if there's, you know, connection with friends in the holidays and things like that. But I think when it becomes a, a dopamine sort of dependency and it, it becomes the, the be all and end all, yes. it really is a problem. It's not healthy, is it? No. Um, and Chris, so how did uh, how did your school sort of pivot to homeschooling um, these last few months? Um, what what did you use? What tech did you use? You know to do your. I, I mean, I don't know. Did you do lots of live lessons? Did you? I yeah. Think... Well, the answer is <laughs> an interesting one because, as I say, we we've been. I wouldn't say we're chalk and talk. We're not. We're not so traditional. We don't have IT. We have IT in the school. We use it appropriately, but. The moment that we, that I said to my colleagues here at the Elms, we are now going to use Microsoft Teams, or I actually started by saying we're going to do lessons online, um, and their response was incredible. You know, for a bunch of teachers who don't naturally turn to IT, they gave up their Easter holidays and they learned to use Microsoft Teams, which is what we, we finished up with. Um, Lots of concern about how the children would react to it. Actually, they're so resilient and so elastic. They were given a day and they were fine. Um, our parent body, it's really easy to, to say that the teachers were ex excellent and the children were resilient and elastic. Actually, the parent body got right behind it. Um, and it wouldn't have worked without that third corner on the triangle. Um, and actually, my teacher staff, they delivered every minute of every lesson live through the whole of lockdown. How um, amazing. It, yeah, and that was down to our early years as well. Our, even our early, so even the youngest children were being given online lessons and tutorials. Um, we had online chapels, online assemblies, uh, form lunches, tutor wow. period. Yeah, that's so, really good. Really good. Yeah, we and we and from that we've taken a great deal about how we want to move forward and make sure that actually, so actually we're going to set prep from now on via Teams. Um, okay so that the children so if we did go back into a lockdown or anything like that actually the children just slot straight back into it um possibly the uniform list will now include a uh, some form of a laptop you know a 200 pound yes. chromebook something like that so that there's something um they've got collegiate to. yeah so that everyone's got the same same bit of machinery to use um we, potentially you know with what's coming up with september we might do our chapels and assemblies to start with online so but pipe it into each classroom and put it up on the on the screen so the children can can still be still be enjoying that so yeah the lockdown has been horrendous i don't think any children any children across the country will be where they should be on the 1st of september but i'm absolutely confident to say that our children are a, a, a lot further on than than many in the country um i'm sure i think i think that I think that there, there need to be questions asked of unions, et cetera, in the future, because I think that my very personal opinion is that there's been a, a degradation, a duty of care towards the education of children. Um, and I think they've got, they've lost, and there's a lot of very good teachers in the state sector 
yes. who have been hampered, you know, haven't been able to do what they wanted to do. Um, because people come into this job for the children. That's that's what they do it for. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, and so, you know, so, so there have been some, I suppose, good good things that have, have come out of it, would you say? I mean, I suppose children have shown how resilient they are and that if a further future lockdown takes place, they're equipped, you're all equipped to handle it. Um, there, has, there has to have been positives, Panda, because if to have six months of no positives in a child, you know, when you think about um, how, you know, how many six month periods there have been in an 11 year old's life yeah. and, you, and you give up a, a good chunk of that and say there's no positive coming out of it. Well, not happening. You know, it can't, right. that can't be the case. So, you know, the children have, I mean, blimey, they even challenged me. I had to cake, bake a cake one day. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> I had to learn how to play the guitar and sing a song for them. Brilliant. But, but then they all, they all did their challenges. You know, I, I got a letter yesterday from one of my year six girls who went out and found 15 wildflowers and pressed them and put them on the front of a card to send me. Oh, sweet. That was one of her challenges. So, you know, No, isn't that positive. brilliant? Yeah. No, it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Um, and um, so your teaching staff, did you have to furlough any of them or did they carry on because you were doing the online lessons? And we, we were very conscious of the amount of time our children would, would suddenly be spending in front of the computer. Yes. So we changed, we altered our school day, uh, started at 8.40 but fin finished at 3.30 and we did furlough music, art and drama yeah. um, staff. It was a very tough choice but, and because we, we valued the arts enormously at the Elms. Um, but the, the long and short of it is that actually though, we gave them, we gave them art, music and, and sports as well. We obviously furloughed sport staff. Um, they were given projects to do, things to achieve, things to work on. Um, but we wanted that to be very much more independent um, yeah. uh, because we felt that the children were going to have to, and the parents also were already having to give up a lot of time to you know, to a computer screen yeah. and it, but you know, the, the long and short of it is that the shame of it actually is that lots of children, although they might like maths and science, but I mean, they really love their art and their, their drama. So when they come back in September, we're going to have a few days of, of the arts. With, oh, I love you know, that. Yeah. I think it's also a really good way of integrating them back into school. You know, got lots of new children starting. I have one girl, bless her, started last term. She hasn't been in school yet. Oh, um, poor thing. It's quite so, tough for yeah. them, actually, isn't it? Because they've barely, um, well, my daughter started at Cheltenham College last, well, yeah, last September. But, yeah. you know, hasn't really done, done a, well, term and a, well, nearly yeah. two terms, I suppose. But it will feel like starting again a bit, probably, it will. this September. It will, and my son starts at Cheltenham College actually. Oh, in does he? September. Yeah, my 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 eldest one is there. She's in going into year eleven. Oh, really? Um, okay, I didn't yeah. realise that. Yeah, so fantastic. Because I think also we've got you know this is it's going to be really difficult you know and the start that children get you know the next year next term is going to be it's just going to be a bit strange as well. It so. is going to be strange. Well, we just mm. got to pray that. Yeah things can sort of carry on in some sort of normal. Um, but I just, I just don't feel there is any reason that th at the moment, the way things are, we've met this morning, I've got, got meetings this afternoon looking at this, you know, with determination, a bit of lateral thinking, um, you can write your risk assessments. You can, you can make sure that everything is, is going to be clean, you know, mm. and you can deliver, you can deliver what the children need, which is yeah. quality education yeah. and the socialization. Really they important. They need to socialize, don't they? I think mm. it's not healthy for them, is it? Being no. stuck at home with their parents. <laughs> no, certainly my children wouldn't think so. No, nor do mine. Um, are there any new, uh, any sort of new subjects or skills that you're you're introducing into your curriculum? Our curriculum is, is pretty wide. I mean, we, we actually have rural studies in our curriculum as a, as a lesson a week. So wow. we're lucky to have a have a full working farm as part of the school, which is not a petting zoo. It's um, I think the danger with, with farms is that people look at a, far, a school with a farm and think immediately of learning difficulties. Um, 
which is a great shame because actually our, our farm is just a brilliant resource um, for, for all children. And, you know, they, they are, I was talking to parents again today about, you know, the fact that our children have seen, uh, they see, see the sow farrowing, uh, they talk about the agricultural revolution, they work out how much feed that you'll need to get them to a certain weight so they can sell them or so, you know, it's, a, they, it's the full cycle. Yes. Um, with our rural studies. Um, and I really, really enjoy the way we use that as a school. Uh, our musical theatre here is oh, phenomenal. It really is. Um, I think our drama, our musical theatre, our music, so good and they promote that confidence there's just our children just seem to have this they grow there's not it's it's a fine line between being you know not arrogant but over the top and being confident yes. and our yes. children get that absolutely right I think from the exposure they get to it from an early age um but actually absolutely. my probably my biggest excitement is that we, we're launching a whole set of new clubs um, which even our head of early years is trying to find a banger to do up so the children can do mechanics. Um, great, great idea. Yeah, so uh, it's fun. things like that that I'm, yeah, I'm looking yeah. forward to that. Mountain, mountain biking as well, setting up a mountain biking course and going up on the Malvern Hills. Be good yes, fun. you're perfectly placed for that actually, aren't you? That will so get I them all fit. Yeah, I was going to say I might enjoy the downhill bit a bit more. Yeah, yeah. Bit. Yeah. yeah, the uphill might be a bit of a nightmare. Gosh. Yeah. Um, and uh, Chris, what percentage of your your students are foreign? Have you got? I mean, is there a concern about them coming back? And you know. Well, we we've got ten percent. We we have a cap of ten percent currently on our overseas pupils. Five percent from Asia, five percent rest of the world. Um, all our pupils from Hong Kong are returning happy on the 1st of Sep um, 10th of September. The pupils from China have actually all deferred until January. Uh, Spanish children will come back. They're just coming over to quarantine. So actually we're partly we, we win because we're not dependent. We haven't got a huge, we haven't got 40% of our children from overseas. That would be a, gr a great concern yes. if that was the yeah. case. Oh, lucky. Um, so we we ben we're benefiting from having less children less children from overseas in school, uh, and actually, I, I in my two and a half years, I I could probably safely say that I've increased the number from overseas. I think quite rightly, I think that the children need to you know it's a, it's a small world out there in in reality, and and when they get to their senior schools, they will meet people from other cultures, and they need to understand that you know the diversity that's around them. I think we sort of all realised more than ever how small this world is. The recent yeah. months have sort of made us, yeah. I think, realise. Um, will this uh, COVID thing affect the sports you can play in the mm. coming months? I mean, are you allowed to sort of do rugby and I don't know? Rugby, I think oh, grassroots rugby, they've gone back, they've said now we can play touch rugby. So okay. contact rugby. I think the what will suffer is probably inter-school fixtures so we oh, yeah. we have fixtures on wednesdays and saturdays um that will be difficult to start with although cricket now is being played so we we are we've kept uh, we anticipated that cricket would probably be one of the first sports that they could go back to yes um, and so we've kept our we've maintained our cricket wickets and things through the summer holidays which normally we wouldn't yeah. so that actually if the children come back we can um hopefully arrange some cricket fixtures with other schools and certainly the children here can act, can can enjoy that um which we're, we're just going to be guided have to be guided yeah. by government legislation so it's uh, yes. it's no, it's going exactly. to be interesting and certainly the the bubble the idea of bubbles for year groups a lot of schools would play sort of year seven and eight together for instance at the top of a school well if they're now in a bubble where you can't mix them yeah it, it becomes very difficult yeah I guess it's but we will we will we will keep it going though because we will keep sport going yeah it's just it's vital for them definitely um and then just uh moving on school fees have have mm. risen <laughs> um above inflation during the, the past 20 20 years uh why do you think that is and do you think the trend will continue um it always seems to be that school fees inflation is two percent about two percent and then school fees you know raised by three percent what are your yeah. thoughts on this it's an expensive habit 
you know yeah. it's it really is and there's no getting away from that you know you 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 i often say to people i i, I deal with two of the most emotional things that people can can give you one's their children and the other is their money you know and it's yeah. and it is a phenomenal amount of money that, that independent schools ask for i think that I think that the independent sector has got to will will be having a very hard look at the moment. I think that this has really put the the fees sort of issue into the spotlight. I know certainly we've we've been benchmarking for the last three years. So actually we've this year, for instance, our senior day fee, we've actually not put it up at all. Our early years fee we've actually reduced. And our, our boarding fee has gone up by 2%, uh, where obviously um, inflation has gone up by two, uh, 1.9, I think. So yes. we, we as a school have been quite mindful, yeah. uh, certainly over the last three years, about affordability. Because it's obviously, the, you know, if people can't afford the fees, the school, schools aren't here. No. Um, but I think that what independent schools, you know, what parents will look for is is the the value for the money that they are they are paying yeah. and you know that each school we go back to the fact that each school is different and each parent will want something different for their for their child um and that's you know that parents just need to ask ask the questions and not i think that there there is a i think slightly to turn it slightly around i think that possibly what independent schools will see is a greater degree of scrutiny from parents to say actually this is the amount i'm paying you know if i was paying this for a car and actually it didn't have air conditioning I can't find anything about air conditioning today um my, but my air conditioning's just broken <laughs> in my car <laughs> not, good. not good um but if you bought it and they said you know it's got air conditioning it didn't have air conditioning then you'd be you'd be asking questions and i think that possibly you know, in, in years gone by, parents have happily just given their children to schools and said, you know, please get on with it. And I think what we're seeing as a, as a sector is a, a scrutiny um, of what we're, what we're delivering. Yeah. Um, which, which is an interesting one, because I think actually as a, as a parent, I, I've got three and I, I hope and think that I'm a parent who I'm giving my children to that school, having, having looked at it very closely before I, give my children to that school yeah and then you know i trust the school to just get on with what i'm what i'm trusting them to do for my children yes yeah so do you think do you think the future of private education is safe oh golly um i mean well i i i do i think it is because i think that it is the it's the best it, it worldwide it's renowned as the best education system in in the world now what that does say to me is are we going to become more dependent on overseas children um potentially and i think we've seen a lot of senior schools especially have have to look overseas to to for for revenue as well as the diversity obviously in the culture yeah. um but there is revenue that comes in from overseas so i do think it's secure but i think it's a i think it's an industry that's going to have to morph slightly to 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 be there to be able to give the give the education it does at the moment yeah yeah um and just finally just interested to know are, are teaching staff hard to find good teaching staff um or do you you know have you got a big large pool to choose from i think it probably depends on the on the on you as a school so I, i've actually had five staff retire this year um, oh, which, and they they have been I think they had 150 years worth of teaching between them um, and it just it just happened they've all retired at the same time yeah so and one of them was my deputy head we had 40 no we didn't we had 90 applicants for the deputy head job you wow, know so I think lot. yeah and Anthony starts with us meeting with him this afternoon actually he will be outstanding but we had an incredible pool of talent to to select from um, but you know we're a co-ed independent prep school rural yeah. so those people you know they you very quickly sift the people who are just looking for a job and I think you as a school you you want you want a type of teacher so I suppose when you're talking about do, do schools have a certain type of child yes um, 
they'll also have a certain, a certain type. type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So we, we, our recruitment, we're, we're very, very careful. Um, and we actually spell out quite clearly at interview what's expected of the teachers. And it does put some off yeah. because it is, it's full on. You know, so yeah. it's a, yeah. a boarding and day school. So the, there's evening duties and things. Um, yes, and it's 100% commitment, isn't it? I suppose. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Chris, um, thank you so much. Um, Pleasure, Panda. You're very kind to um, speak to us today. That's so interesting to hear everything. And Elm sounds absolutely lovely. I wish I had a child young enough to... But I've got one actually at Pinewood, um, but he's sort of ensconced there. If I had any more, I'd be definitely... There you go. Um, thank you very, very much. Good pleasure.